From whistle to gun, there are enough major collisions in pro football to stock a junkyard for a century. Hitting is what separates player from player. One team from another, pretender from contender, and chumps from champions. The NFL is a league where only the fittest survive. A league where the meek do not inherit the turf. It is a game of thunder and destruction. That's what you gotta do! Hi, I'm Steve Sable. You know, fundamentally, football is a simple game. It's not a matter of matching wits. It's about banging heads. And you know what separates football from all the other sports? The pop of a big hit or the impact of a blow so hard it knocks the taste out of your mouth. Search and destroy. That's what playing defense is all about. And two of the most punishing destroyers to ever play the game come from a position noted more for speed than spite, but pound for pound. Defensive backs Dick Night Train Lane and Ronnie Lott are among the most devastating hitters of all time, which makes the secondary a primary place to look when searching for those who destroy. Isolated in the outback of the NFL, cornerbacks and safeties stand alone with their backs against the goal line. The secondary is of primary importance because the men who patrol it must do so with the desperation of knowing that they are the last line of defense. You are protecting a piece of property and uh, you've got to let those people know if they're going to come on your property, they're going to have to pay. Hard-hearted toughness is a must. Each position demands different characteristics. I think, in fact, there are three dividing lines. I think you have corners who have to play out in space. They are the guys that have to be able to run fast, to cover the finest wide receivers in the business. They're playing out there pretty much all alone, on, on whether they're playing a zone or a man coverage, but they're out there in space. Then you have strong safeties who are a different breed. Uh, these are guys that need to have coverage ability, but more than anything, they probably have to be able to come up and support the run. Then you have the free safety, who in my opinion is still another breed. Uh, here's a guy that needs to have great uh, range. The ability to, to move and play at least half of the field. And uh, whether he's playing center field, he needs to be able to cover at least half. The free safety is generally the last line of defense. A runner breaks through or a receiver catches the ball and he's in the open. That guy with range and tackling ability is essential if you're going to eliminate big plays. Most of the time he doesn't have a specific responsibility in terms of a man, but he's reading uh, different things. He may be reading the center and the two guards. He may be reading the backfield action, and that's going to take him to the ball. And most of uh, what the free safeties are judged on in today's game is how much they get to the ball and how quickly they can get there. <laughs> Your progression starts from the free safety and works back towards the line of scrimmage. And the reason being is, you know, 90% of the time, the free safety is going to tell you what, what kind of coverage they're in. If they're in man-to-man, -man, if they're in zone, if they're strong or they're weak. The first and foremost you think is that you look for is the free safety. You know, we got some 
pretty darn good free safeties in this league, and they disguise things after a while. One of the game's best free safeties is Denver's Steve Atwater, number 27. <laughs> Disguise is, is a big part of it, but also I have to make sure I don't disguise so much when I'm out of position to play the defense. Hold up! We got nickel one, DB, back up, watch the screen! I, I do like playing little games with the quarterbacks because you know, they, they try to play games with you. They try to uh, look at you and determine uh, what their play is going to be. A lot of times we get eye contact and I can see that he's looking at me. I don't want to just line up in one spot and give him a chance to, to call his play. So I move around and, and uh, try to confuse him a little bit. I don't know if it works or not, but I, I do it anyway because I see him looking. So yeah. it takes up some time, if nothing else. <laughs> hey, Steve, you're showing your 6 too soon. Okay? Yeah. I'm getting up there and bagging out. Yeah, I'm moving in. Get stay out there. Move back and then come back up. All right? Don't step in there real soon. He yeah. knows what's going on. Being able to support the run, that's a vital part of being a safety. A lot of times... Uh, running backs will, will hit the hole full speed, like I said, and the linebackers and the defensive line won't always get a chance to, to be there. And if you can stop them for a two or three yard gain, that's a big plus. With the quickness to play pass coverage and the bulk and strength of a linebacker, Denver's defense gives Atwater the sort of license and carte blanche reserve for a 007. <laughs> However, instead of a Beretta, number 27 gets the drop on opponents with exceptional athletic skills and unbridled enthusiasm. Throw it to me, baby! Throw it to me! I like having fun out there. Throw it to me! A bunch of different things get me excited. You know, I know one time um, a guy was hurt on the sidelines and the crowd was doing the wave. Work the wave on that ass! Man, I just got me pumped up. I was looking around. Man, yeah, let's go. You have to make it fun. I think you play better when you're you having fun. Come on, big man. You'd be surprised how much of it is mental. Why'd you help him up? Mind game, baby. Mind game. Hey, mind game. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. You get the guys thinking, yeah, this is my buddy, and then you crack him. I don't know, you don't put that on the table. I don't wanna I wanna give away my cigarette, but uh, <laughs> I usually just hit him and usually say something to him. Yeah, whole team, I keep, I try to intimidate him because you know it, it does have an effect regardless of what anybody says. Here we go, D. They can't show on us, baby, they can't show on us. We'll get up top. Hey, Christian in, Christian's still in. Hey, we got lead on his ass this time, baby. Let me really give it up. Lock it up, lock it up, lock it up, lock it up, lock it up. In the Kansas City game, I was standing maybe one man away when he made a big hit on a on a car yet, and just the, the sound of that hit fires you up. And all of a sudden it was like pow, and the running back went backwards. I was looking around to see who the heck made that hit. <laughs> I should have known. It's the first time that I've probably ever seen a 260-pound back run into a free safety and go flat on his back. I mean, it was exciting. <laughs> on the hit with Okoya. It was a big hit at that time, and we're thinking about the next play defensively, but I did take the time and allow myself to watch the replay at Mile High Stadium. And when they replayed it, the whole crowd went... <laughs> Steve Atwater, exciting and punishing proof that in the NFL, the secondary is primary.
When street corner harmonies were cool, the hottest sounds in pro football were being made by a player with a most unique nickname. Number 81, Dick Night Train Lane, played cornerback for the Cardinals, Lions, and Rams in the 50s and 60s. A dazzling, versatile athlete, the train was a locomotive who pulled his teams to victory in a dramatic variety of ways. As a rookie with the Rams in 1952, he intercepted 14 passes, still the highest single season total in NFL history. In desperate times, the Chicago Cardinals deployed their star defender as a receiver. One result was a 98-yard touchdown, the longest in team history. When you're talking about Night Train Lane, you're talking about, in my book, the greatest defensive back that ever played the game. Night Train is the first corner man that I ever saw in the National Football League that could play the bump and run. We uh, had so much... Uh, uh felt so much of toward the uh, night train lane that he came out in one ball game and said, I don't even want you throwing the football over that side. I said, you can't go into a ball game and give a guy a free ride. <laughs> you just can't do that. But he said, don't throw it. While Lane made Unitas pay dearly for defying Coach Reed Eubank, he often defied conventional behavior himself by wearing astronaut clothing and displaying a far-out personality. He came from Texas, and he spoke this very strange language that nobody could quite understand. Try to catch me and body. When the Cleveland Browns, every time they come, they were just a class. They always had the stripes down there. And I said, man. I'm not even sure that he understood a lot of what he was, he was saying. We were all sitting down, and we were trying to get an adjustment on our contract. So we were in this office with uh, E.J. Uh, Anderson, who was at that time the general manager. And he had on the blackboard behind him all these numbers. <laughs> popcorn 25 cents a box now going up to 30 all the costs and night train was in the back of the room just steaming and he finally looked up he said say mr anderson he said yes night train he said am i under the consumption that there ain't no more money <laughs> night trains tackles were anything but funny his motto was hang them high and his signature hits were more like stranglings or beheadings I know when he went to the Detroit Lions and uh, he was my opponent at that time, you got to think about it because he hurt you. Oh, he'd kill you. Kill you. He wouldn't tackle you necessarily. Fair. It wouldn't be a fair tackle. They made a head tackle on Outlaw because of Night Train Lane. Train would just reach and grab him by his neck and just pull him down. And that's called the Night Train Neck Tackle. He grabbed your face mask. Uh, I remember somebody speaking to Train about it. Train said, I'll grab him by his eyebrows if I still I can get him down. Because if you don't hit him right, you break your elbow, your arm or something, you know. So you got to really get him right in front of you and hit him with that forearm and rip him up. However, his love for hitting led to hateful mistakes. Sometimes, he even traded punches and lost. The meek did not inherit this turn, and opponents went to any extremes to pay him back, to rub him out. Perhaps this one play reveals Lane's greatness, his competitive fire. For Night Train Lane never gave up, never quit on a play. In the slang of the times, he bopped till he dropped. Probably even playing today, Night Train Lane would uh, be as good as any cornerback in football. He would, had to be the prototype for what an NFL cornerback should be. He was one of the few players that hurt you every time he tackled you, Butkus being the other one. Night Train Lane was the hardest hitter of any defensive back in pro football history. And arguably the greatest player at his position. Now this free agent who once hung him high hangs himself in the Hall of Fame.
Ronnie Lott has been a defensive star for the San Francisco 49ers from the moment he arrived as a first-round draft choice in 1981. He has intercepted more passes and returned them for more yards than anyone in 49er history. He's been selected for the Pro Bowl seven times, four times at cornerback and three at safety. He is a gifted player, but not quite gifted enough to become one of the all-time greats on talent alone. That he has become one is a tribute to his tenacity and perseverance. This is a guy who utterly refuses to lose. He does not understand the concept of giving up. He does not understand the concept of defeat. And even when we have lost games, when you go back and look at Ronnie Lott's play, he won. He was not dominated, he was not defeated, he was not fooled, he was not tricked. I think if one word really describes Ronnie Lott, it would be supreme determination. Ronnie Lott is a man of courage as well as determination. And through the exercise of both, he has made himself an example to the rest of the team. He's been one heck of a teacher, you know, aside from being one, one fun, great football player. And uh, we kid him and call him the Big Cheese. He really walks his talk. He's one of those kind of guys. And he's a guy you want to go to war with because he's not only going to be out there right beside you, most of the time he's going to be in front of you. So uh, the cheese says it all about him. <laughs> As a defensive back, Lott lives at the frontier of instinct and reflex, where the difference between success and failure can be measured in inches and seconds. It is Lott's high level of concentration that carries him above the level of his ability. I think my greatest asset as a football player is uh, understanding the game, understanding what's happening in every situation of the game and uh, to me that's enabled me to be able to make plays in certain situations the situation super bowl 24. 23 first quarter the 49er defense is under attack the cincinnati running game was dominating our play at that time and uh if he would each time he get the ball it seems that he was getting stronger you could you could sense that. i was in the press box and you could sense him taking over the ball game if you watch all the films Prior to that game, it wasn't one free safety that had came up and hit Icky Woods straight up. Most of the people that have got good shots on Icky were hitting him on glancing blows, not direct on, but from sides. So I knew going into this game that I had to uh, deliver a blow. You know, uh, I just wanted to come after him and make sure that he realized that it was going to be somebody there that was going to attack him. It was like. You know, Ronnie Lott to the rescue. I mean, how many times has the man done this in his career? But his hit uh, just slowed him down a little bit, slowed uh, Icky down a little bit, and it set the tempo for the rest of our defense. For 10 years, Ronnie Lott has set the tempo for San Francisco. He hit so hard and with such fury that some wide receivers cringe at the thought of running roots into his territory. Said one receiver, he hit me so hard he knocked the taste out of my mouth. He hits people so hard that, I mean, if, if somebody was to hit my son like that, I'd probably come to the game with a shotgun and shoot him. I mean, but he has no, he has no regard to his own physical well-being. He just goes out and he pretends his body is a cannonball and he just explodes into people. So he's an unbelievable person, unbelievably intense. And I think football gives him an opportunity to express that side of his personality. I think the, the hitting is very critical to my expression as a person and as a player because what it exemplifies is the fact that I'm given 110%. Some people play with heart, some people don't play with heart. And uh, I'm sure you have some consequences that go along with that, but you don't worry about that at the time. You have to find a way to, to give a little bit of yourself, whether it's giving yourself up, running into somebody that's much bigger than you, or it's, you know doing something to sacrifice yourself for the team. 
To his teammates, Ronnie Lott is invincible, if not in the flesh, at least in the spirit. He is truly a unique competitor, one who looks beyond winning and losing to measure himself by only one standard. I think the way you measure it is respect. I've always said this and I've always believed in this, that when you walk off that football field, does your opponent respect you? That's the bottom line. And when you play football, the key is not actually winning, it's playing up to your standard. And that standard, it demands respect from your opponents, from your teammates. And I really believe that if you go out there and you can get some respect from your mom, your dad, your friends, the city of San Francisco, and your teammates, 10 years from now, the most important thing that you'll remember is that when you see some of these people that are in your life, they will respect you for what you did on the football field. Bottom line. Night Train Lane is already enshrined in the Hall of Fame, and it's only a matter of time before Ronnie Lott joins him. But every season, hits worthy of the Hall of Fame are made by men who do their shining out of the limelight. First, there's the offensive line, a hidden battleground where an ounce of anger is worth more than a pound of strategy. Then our next feature is on a superb group of defenders known to history only as the no-names. And finally, there's Tim Harris, a man with all the subtlety of a truck coming at you in the wrong lane. Now, all of these men have something in common. They've caused their opponents to see stars without ever having become stars themselves. Now, if you're the type who loves disaster movies, or if news clips of hurricanes are your idea of late-night entertainment, then you're going to enjoy these next three profiles. Let's go forward into battle with the game's unknown soldiers. It has never been easy for an offensive lineman to achieve glory in the NFL. These men have literally been thrown together by their mutual anonymity and the thankless nature of their position. Being an offensive lineman is a little bit like a mushroom. Uh, they, you know, they keep you in the dark and they feed you. The point is, is that the guy doesn't get a lot of credit for the success of the team, or in a general sense, and so on and so on. But an offensive line, you don't see them usually being goodwill ambassadors either, because a guy might be as good as he is in the whole league and go out on a speaking engagement, and nobody even knows who the guy is. You accept your job description, you accept the lack of notoriety early when you become an offensive lineman. As an offensive line goes, so does the, the offense, and, and that's where the foundation of the team is built. He's, he's letting the momentum die on us. We should, we should line up and go right now. You know what I'm saying? It's an old man Moore is on our side. 99% of the people watching, huh, they don't know an offensive lineman from a cheerleader. The only time they ever know about it is when the quarterback is sacked and John Madden or somebody draws up the figures on the chalkboard and says, look how this guy got beat. If you're playing bad, the nation knows about it. All you got to do is get beat and let your quarterback get hurt. One play, you might play perfect 79 out of 8 times and have somebody come in and just kill you. But your quarterback, and you've had, you know, that's a nightmare for you. That's the worst game you could have had because of that one play. You know, when you're laying there or whatever and you see him uh, with a beat on the quarterback, um, you know, you just kind of want to say look out or something, but <laughs> you really... You can't, you know, you want to say, oh, you know. <laughs> it's tough when you get beat for a sack, um, but it's just something that you realize uh, it's going to happen every once in a while. Yeah. Can't you play? Huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. I got to get some No, I can get in there. I'll be there. 
it frustrates you for a second. You get mad at yourself, I think. And then you just kind of have to try to figure out what you did wrong and then just block it out and go on to the next play, and, you know, you can't let it get you down. Hey, don't let that drive you crazy. What happened to you? I, just said, I thought he was going to loop, and I... Sets off. Sets off. off and, hey, that play's over. Now. Yeah. Invisible. It's a good description, but there are times when you do get publicized, uh holding penalties or something like that. Hey, fellas, come here, lineman. Come here now. Will, come here. Hey, you got them just where you want them. They're ready to quit. We just run for two first downs, and we keep giving them a holding penalty. Now get in the game, man. Did you hear anybody? And you're not with nobody there to hit. Look, look around. All right. Keep your head on the swivel if ain't nobody there to hit, right? <laughs> The other part that you really have to be is you have to be tough. And toughness isn't what you might think of in terms of the snot bubbling out of a guy's nose and there's spit going somewhere and there's blood somewhere else and the helmet spun around the top of the head and all that sort of thing. It's a function of how much you can take, not how much you give out necessarily. Every snap of the ball, they're hitting somebody constant smash face. I mean, that's all they do is just hit people. And so I would think that the hardest thing would, would be the toll that it takes on their body. It's like getting into a car wreck 80 times a ball game. You can just imagine putting yourself in a car and running into the wall at, let's say, 30 miles an hour. 80 times in a row with 30 seconds rest in between, then that's what it would be like. Did the wrong play? No, uh, don't do that. Well, not, not like that. I don't think I really hear anything but the uh, things that I try to lock in on, like on the quarterback's voice. You take them. Just the people around you. <laughs> I don't really hear all the hitting or grunting or whatever. <laughs> the sound is kind of what makes it really look intense, I think. Switch it, switch it. But I don't really notice that when I'm out in the field. It's all a pushing and shoving. And driving and growling and hitting and all. And nobody sees it but your peers. There's only seven or eight guys in the world that really know how you played and one coach. And yet you play for acknowledgement from that little group and they're your family and that's all you got when you're in the pits. That's really how it is. seen in their small moments of triumph. Offensive linemen exist in an intense world of diligence without reward, success without applause. They take great pride in making others famous, often sacrificing individual stardom for team achievement. The fun part of it is when you win. And we enjoy a win just as much as the Anthony Carter's and the personal walkers of the world. I promise you, we had joy when we win. I think we got them. All right, all right. Good news, good news. It has been said that the only two people who recognize an offensive lineman are his mother and his quarterback. Still, in the world of pro football, these invisible men are the difference between winning and losing. Intelligent, disciplined, aggressive. They were hard-nosed, persistent, stifling, opportunistic. 
The Miami defense was the backbone of the Dolphins' dynasty of the early 70s and helped lead them to three straight Super Bowls, including a perfect season in 1972. Still no member of this unit is in the Hall of Fame. In fact, it was made up of a group of players so anonymous, they became known as the No Names. I think someone just wrote about uh, uh, the fact that they analyzed the defense, but uh, as they looked around, they said it's really a no-name defense. And I think at first, uh, the players sort of resented it, but after a while, it sort of became uh, sort of a, uh, an affection for them. They, they really felt good about it. And a matter of fact, I remember someone took a picture and put it on a poster, and it said, the no-name defense, can you recognize these players? And they had us wearing uh, masks, little Long Ranger masks. The most famous, make that the least unknown of the group, was linebacker Nick Bonaconti, though he hardly fit the mold of a premier defender. He was too small and uh, he wasn't fast, you know, and, and right now, if he were coming out of college and all of his stats were in the computer, I guarantee you he would be a reject. He would never get a chance to come to an NFL camp. But the thing that you can't measure with a computer is heart. That's what Bonacani had. Plus, he had this tremendous uh, leadership ability. He wouldn't stand for anything but best effort. He wouldn't tolerate mistakes by his teammates, and he never made any mistakes himself. Following Bonaconti's lead were defensive ends Bill Stanfield, number 84, and Vern Dan Herder, number 83, as well as tackles Bob Heinz and number 75, ferocious Manny Fernandez. But overall, the Dolphins weren't quite as physical as they were tactical. Defensive coordinator Bill Arnsparger was a mastermind who brought about the advent of situation substitution with the 53 defense, named for its key component, number 53, linebacker Bob Matheson. The 53 defense shows the brilliance of Bill Arnsbarger. I think we ended up with a, a defensive lineman short, and, and Matheson was the biggest uh, linebacker we had. So Bill puts him up on the end of the line and says, well, we'll rush him. Arnsbarger's use of a linebacker as a pass rusher revolutionized pro football and befuddled every offense the Dolphins faced. The whole idea to our defensive scheme was to keep the offense off guard, to not let them know who is coming or where they're coming from so that they would make a mistake. Equally as frustrating for opponents was Miami's nearly impenetrable secondary, where number 40 Dick Anderson, Lloyd Mumford, Curtis Johnson, and number 13 Jake Scott skillfully disguised their zone coverages and rarely made an error in judgment. Bill Arnsbarger said, in the year that we went undefeated, we made 13 mental mistakes the entire year. That is incredible. Miami made its opponents pay dearly for every mistake. Yet perhaps no play better illustrates the Dolphins' defensive teamwork than a Dick Anderson interception against the Colts in the 1971 AFC Championship. It was a 62-yard return uh, where our defensive players made uh, seven perfect blocks. A once in a lifetime opportunity. There were Colts just laying on the ground. And all I had to do was run around them. Funny story about that is Nick Bonacani keeps telling me that, you know, I was so slow that he went out and got a hot dog and I came back, I was still running. And I said, that's because you're the only one that didn't make a block. They say that nobody's perfect. But in the early 70s, the Dolphins' defense marched in near precision. They were heroes whose identities remained a mystery. And to this day, we still wonder just who were those masked men? Individually, they weren't any names, but together they were the no-names.
We didn't mind that term at all. We didn't have any stars on that team. We had a lot of great individuals that uh, played as a group, and, and yeah, we wore that as a badge. Go get him, dear. I bet your ass didn't shut up today. <laughs> <laughs> Why you say that, Lily? I never do shut up, do I? Uh, you used to sit damn quiet that nobody can ever hear you. Now oh, Lily, you know how. You get wired for sound, you your ass is going to be motor mouth. Oh, I'm wired too big time. You better believe it. All right, take it back to the goal line. All right. Oh, we got y'all holding. Let's back y'all up a couple more yards. Hey, Dalton, we got y'all holding. Hey, hey. I think I'm the aggressive, crazy type, I guess. Take him all back. Take him all back. There we go. Free call. Hey, baby, what's happening today? Uh-uh. When I'm out there playing football, it's like I'm just like a little kid in a candy store. It's just my time to be myself where nobody tells me how to act and nobody tells me what to do, and I just go out and be myself and have a good time when I'm out there playing. Hey, let's go. Bring it out. People mention my name. They mention loud talker, a big mouth and all that. Great call, great call. Hey, hey, we say, brother. Most of the time, I just ramble off of the mouth, and usually something good always comes out. Hey, Dombrowski, how's it been going, man? How's life been treating you, baby? Oh, I'm making it. Huh? Oh, it's burning up. I love it like this, though. I figure y'all gonna get a little bit tired of quicker than I do. I try to get a guy out of his game plan. So if he's out of his game plan mentally where he's mad at me, he's trying to hurt me the whole time, he's not doing his job, and I feel I've accomplished something by then. What the f*** is that? Oh, Dombrowski, look at you, man. You trying to break my back, man? Well, he does do a lot of talking out there. He's definitely not afraid to, to say what he's got on his mind out there and tell the tell the players on the other team, you know, what he thinks of them or, or things like that or what he's going to do to them. All day, brother. All f***ing day long. You know, some guys look at me sometimes like, hey, Harris, you never stop, you know, so <laughs> I'm not going to stop. Hey, let's go offense, baby. Come on, let's move the ball. Let's get a first down on him. Tear him up, Sterling. Get him, baby. Look at him. He got fear in his eyes. Get him, Sterling. That's what I enjoy doing. That's how I play my tight ball game. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. They're going to tear your up when you get back there on that wall now. They're going to tear your ass up, brother. <laughs> They're going to tear you up, 85. They're going to tear you up when you get in that wall. You know that, don't you? Yeah, they're going to tear that mm. up when you get in that wall. Oh, here they go with the wage drill again when the office is on the field. Come on, guys. Don't start the wage drill now. Office is on the field. You're not supposed to do the wage drill when the office is out there. No, don't do it now. All right, we get to play some more defense. All right. Woo Coming on you, Cooper. Better keep them eyes open. We may lose some respect from the players by doing those types of things. But I think his actions, you know, speak louder than his words. You know where he's at. I mean, if he misses you, you know, you're going to hear about it. Yeah, I'm going to get you, sucker. I'm going to get you. I'm coming back next play. I'm going to line up twice as hard. I'm going to get you back. I'm going to get you back for that 7 9 Derby. I'm going to get you back for that Derby. That's right. You see it. You better believe it. See there? I'm going to get you back, Derby. Tim Harris is an opponent's worst nightmare. But his hustle is a coach's dream. What do you say, Rob Brown? Hey, hey, baby, get here. Yes! I like the way Timmy plays. I don't have find any fault with the way he plays and the way he demonstrates during the course of a football game. Who is that, baby? We bring it in. We bring it in today. Put his ass out of there. Oh, he'll spin his imaginary six shooters and do those types of things, and he tries to get the crowd involved, which I think is good for our football team. And I wish we had more that had the enthusiasm about the game that Timmy has. Hey, guys. Are y'all through cheering today or what? I know it. I know it's hot day outside today. Come on, guys. Get some noise. Come on. Come on. 
Get up right here! Can't hear nobody over there! Come on! He's not trying to intimidate anybody with it. I think he's just excited. And when something happens, he's a very spontaneous person. Come on, guys! Come on! Look at there! Y'all dragged down already? This ain't a tennis match! <laughs> My guns are just like American Express card. Don't leave home without them. I like those guns right there. Shoot them up all day long today. Shoot them up all day long. I don't see it as being hot dogs or doing nothing like that. I don't I don't do it for that reason. I do it just for me, just getting excited, you know, and I, I do enjoy the game, you know. Hey, hey, Ty, say see you all day, baby. How's it going? I don't look at this game as a job, I guess. I look at it as a sport and I really enjoy it. I feel that once the fun goes out of it, I think I'll be out of this game because I'm out here to have some fun and I really enjoy myself. Yeah, baby! You better believe it, though! You better believe it, baby! Yes! Woo! Hell yes! He just ran right into me that time. <laughs> Tim Harris may never get all the publicity that he richly deserves. But NFL history has a wealth of famous hitters. You know the names Butkus, Tatum, and Lambert. Each has earned an exalted place in the pantheon of the NFL. You know, Newt Rockney used to say, you don't have to see a good tackle to appreciate it. You can hear it. Well, their hits echoed on the field and still linger in our memories. But while the NFL reveres its legends, it's hungry, young players who will ensure that fierce hitting will never go out of style. Today, the NFL's two premier hitters are Bruce Smith and Derek Thomas. Now, each has superb physical tools, but their job isn't construction, it's destruction. Or to put it more bluntly, trouble is their business, and nobody closes a deal like Messrs. Smith and Thomas. While the 80s belong to Lawrence Taylor, the new decade will be dominated defensively by Derek Thomas. There's certainly a guy who has all the qualities to rush the quarterback and a very natural pass rusher. He's got an air of excitement about him. He loves to play the game and he plays the game relentlessly. You never realize how quick someone is until you watch film on them and you see what they're doing and then you watch film on him and you see him just blowing by guys and them not even getting their hands on them. I mean, that's tremendous. Intimidating. <laughs> Ruthless. You love to watch this young guy go in the backfield and just cause havoc with quarterbacks. Something that they haven't had here in Kansas City in a very long time. And it's nice to see that there is someone who has that mentality of ripping someone's face off, and that's Derek Thomas. The only thing that would ever limit Derek would be himself. Uh, he has great skills. As long as he maintains a sense of pride, he can be an outstanding linebacker. Derek Thomas became an instant success in the NFL because of the highly polished pass rushing skills he developed at the University of Alabama. Thomas not only followed in the footsteps of his predecessor, Cornelius Bennett, he created even bigger footprints, and his crimson shadow was cast over every opponent. Shadows that grew as much from hard work as God-given talent. I can't even tell you how big my heart is because I'm, I consider myself as a winner and I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. If it takes playing 65 minutes, I'll play 65 minutes. I'll never quit. Pass rushing to me is like a back getting the ball. The defense has to stop that back. And for me, it's like I'm a running back and I have the ball and they have to actually stop me. And I think sometimes I, I utilize some of the moves that a back would use in order to get there. You get to that point to where you say, well, he's in sight. 
And at that point, you just lock him in and, and go for it. The highly motivated pass rusher registered an NFL record 30 sacks in his first two seasons. In 1990, Thomas sacked quarterbacks 20 times. And on November 11th, he set an NFL single game record with an amazing performance against the Seattle Seahawks and quarterback Dave Craig. Shotgun. He's back to throw. Hit at the goal line. Ball charge free. Fumble. Recovered by Kansas City. Touchdown, Kansas City. Oh, what a play! I was thinking that probably the Seahawks are going to be looking for a new left tackle because uh, it was a long afternoon for him. Right back to pass on first down. In trouble and down he goes. Derek Thomas got him. After I got the, the first two on my first two rushes, I had two sacks. And I said that this, this could be a remarkable day. Derek, good job. Coach just kept making the calls and kept putting me in a position to where I could utilize what I do best. You got him up the field once, you got him inside once, didn't you? Good. Keep working on him. Now you ought to get him right. He'll be rocking on you. Come on, Derek. Come on, Derek. Run it down. When I got two and then three and then four and then everybody was like, well, go for the record and five. And the, the sixth one was a funny one because the play went away and I thought the quarterback had already thrown the ball and I was just really standing there in the corner and I see the quarterback coming back across the field. So I ran and got a sack. That was a freebie. So that was number six. Was right, looking down the field. Thomas sacks him again. Another sack for Derek Thomas. What's new? And then number seven came and then it was like, you got the record. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. But like any fish story, it was the one that got away that proved to be the biggest. The thing I most remember about that game is the sack I didn't get. And that's the one that still haunts me. Derek Thomas is a key here. See if he can put the heat on him. Last play of the ball game. Snap to Craig. Back to pass. Derek Thomas comes in and Craig breaks the tackle of Thomas. Craig throws in the end zone. It's caught. Touchdown, Seattle. I don't believe it. Touchdown, Seattle. Now, i tell you what I liked about what he said after that game. Even though he had seven sacks, set the NFL record, he says the sack that I didn't get, which was the last play of the game in which they, uh, Craig got out and threw the ball for a touchdown to beat us on, That he said that's the one he'll remember the most. And that's the type of player you really want on your football team. And I know he, he means that. There's only going to be a few people ever that's the best at what they do. And, you know, right now, Lawrence Taylor is the best. And one day, I want to achieve that status. I want to be the best linebacker in the NFL. LT, the 90s belong to DT. In Buffalo, the fans' favorite chant is... And their favorite player is Bruce Smith, the most dynamic defender in the NFL. Smith was the NFL's number one draft choice in 1985, the AFC's Defensive Rookie of the Year, and a consensus all-pro every season thereafter. Bruce Smith, to me, is the best defensive end in, in, in the AFC this year. I haven't seen anybody come off the ball and release from a blocker as quick as Bruce Smith. First player pick when he came in, living absolutely up to that billing. I think he's the most devastating pass rusher in the league. Smith demolishes pass pockets and destroys quarterbacks. He averages an incredible 13 sacks a season and is already the all-time sack leader in Bill's history. Despite such fearsome and impressive credentials, the imposing sack master has suffered from an inferiority complex. Hope I can get some credit now. Been denying me ever since I've been in the league. 
to me, he's the best defensive lineman in, in football today. And uh, I don't think that I've ever seen anybody with the power and the speed and uh, the ability to play both run and pass as well as he does. Most great pass rushers are not great run defenders, but Smith is that rare notable exception. He is not easily trapped, suckered, or lured into dead ends, for it is he who becomes the end of the road for running backs. Probably the quickest spin move I've ever seen in my life for a big defensive lineman. I tell you, I've, I've seen some of those spin moves that he's done on linemen, and uh, I'm glad I'm not a lineman. <laughs> While some players command center stage, Bruce Smith is center stage. And while the play is the thing, it is the performance after the play that is his thing. Like the postman, Bruce Smith delivers in any kind of weather. It may be cold in Buffalo, but we're going to heat it up, baby. And when he delivers, his tackles bear a very special step. Oh, I forgot. Hammer time! Hammer time! Hammer time to me is big plays on defense. Um, you get a sack and a force fumble. You do something to disrupt the offense. Play Salisbury backing up in the pocket near the goal line, and he uh, loses the ball, and uh, Bruce Smith grabs it. They're going to rule it. What, a safety or a touchdown? Sure, it's a touchdown. The ball was on the carpet. Bruce Smith picked it up. How do you like that? That's poetic justice for the big man. That's hammering down on him. Uh, you, you get on him, and you pound on him. You never let him get back up. I mean, you just keep beating down on him until you can't see the head of the nail anymore. It's, it's, it's about an inch down into the wood, and you just keep keep pounding and keep pounding. Perhaps no player his size has ever been so agile, so nimble, so graceful, so utterly inescapable. In 1990, as thoroughly as Smith overpowered opponents, the Bills dominated the AFC and won its championship. Where are we going? To the show. Where are we going? To the show. What time? Next week. What time is it? Showtime, baby. Yeah. On Pro Football's biggest stage, Bruce Smith gave one of his greatest performances. First down's the key. You win on first down, huh? Then you kick ass on third down. In the second quarter, number 78 made what seemed at the time a tide-turning play. Comes to the left, double tight ends, one set back Anderson, and Hustetler may put it up here. On second down, he's going to throw, and they're after him. He falls down in the end zone. Yeah, Jeff Hosteller trying to roll out to the right, just didn't have foot speed. Bruce Smith in there like a flash, sacked him in the end zone for the safety. Good job out there. Great series. Great series, baby. That's the way to go. Great series out there. That's the way to pressure. Bruce Smith dwarfs pro football like a colossus, the most pulverizingly powerful and dynamic defender in the game. Is he the best defensive player in the pros? Hey, just ask him. Hey, baby, are y'all convinced now? <laughs> <laughs>